All right, and for this last one, we actually have like an integral problem. It's a little bit complicated. We have that a company produces and sells electric cars. The company's profit P in thousands of dollars changes based on the number of cars X they produce per month. The rate of change of their profit for producing X electric cars is modeled by blah. Okay. The company makes a profit of 2000, sorry, $1,000 when they produce 15 electric cars. This information seems useful. We're probably going to have to use it later. For part A, we need to find an expression for P in terms of X. Now, when they say P in terms of X, that means P of X. See? This right here is not P in terms of X. That is like, well, it's the derivative, right? We're talking about rate of change, etc. So to reach P of X, you actually have to take the derivative, do the integral of that guy, and you end up with P of X. See? Why is that the case? Well, the intuition is that the integral is the opposite to the derivative. And so that's how you end up with the original one. See, it kind of like, it cancels out, you end up with the original one, see? And so we have to do the integral of our first derivative in order to get the original function, see? Now, at the IB Math Studies level, we only work with the derivative of an exponent, so I'm gonna spend some time talking about that. The thing is, if I have, say, like, I don't know, three x squared, and I do the derivative of this, I end up with 6x. How do I know? Because the step in between is 3 times 2x, 2 minus 1 on the exponent. So that's what's going on in between. This is actually in, our, in your formula booklet. The exponent multiplies whatever is in front, and the exponent gets subtracted by 1. See? That's how you end up with 6x. So having that in mind, you, you just kind of have to, like, think long and hard and go backwards, this negative 1.6, how did it appear? It appeared because I had a number that got multiplied. So I'm going to call that number whatever, z. And it got multiplied by 2, which gave me negative 1.6. So negative 1.6 is the result of the integral, t. z is from my original function, and 2 appears because I know that there used to be a 2 because there's an x that has a 1 here, ¿cierto? So if in the derivative I have an x with an exponent of 1, that means that the original one had an exponent of 2. That's no different than what we have here in the example I made up. If in my derivative we have an x with an exponent of 1, that means that in my original one, we had an x with an exponent of 2. It is no different. See, So that is how I know that there is a 2 here, because there is an x with a 1 there. See, Again, this is the kind of thing you have to think long and hard about. It is working backwards. It is mental work. But intuitively, that's how I can explain it. So um, to find my z value, I'm going to divide by 2 to both sides. ¿cierto? I end up with z being equal to 0.8. ¿vale? Oh, negative 0.8. Sorry. So z equals negative 0.8. That means that in our original function, we have a negative 0.8x squared right here. See? We're going to keep going with the other values and see what happens. See? So this 48 has no x next to it. If it has no x next to it, that means it has to be 48x. This is the same intuition that I just shared. Going a little bit more in depth, the thing is, if, it, if in my original one, ¿cierto? I have 48x and I do the derivative, that means I have a 1 that multiplies, ¿cierto? so 1 times 48, and this 1 gets a minus 1 applied to it, so I end up with 0, ¿cierto? so it's actually 48 times x to the power of 0, anything to the power of 0 is just 1, 48 times 1, 48, see? Now why is x to the power of 0 1? Well, the intuition is that, and I should actually do this elsewhere, Anything to the power of 0 is 1. See? If I have 2 to the power of 1, it's 2. 2 to the power of 2 is 4. 2 to the power of 3, it's th 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 8. See? And so math is often uh, considered like the study of patterns. See? So what pattern arises here? Well, to go from 1 to the next, I am doing times 2. Times 2. If I go backwards, I am divided by 2. I am divided by 2. So if I divide by 2 here, 2 divided by 2, I end up with 1. See? That is why anything to the power of 0 is always, always going to be 1. You can see the same pattern arise 
with 3 squared, for example. See, so 3 squared is 9, 3 cubed is 27, 3 to the power 1 is 3, 3 to the power of 0 has to be 1, because they divide by 3 each time. See, this is the conclusion you always reach. Anyways, that was a mini lesson on why anything to the power of 0 is 1. Got it? So, point is, in my original one, I have this guy and this guy, and I'm missing one more thing. See? In theory, in theory, I could have a constant here. See? I could have a constant that disappeared when once I did the derivative, right? If I have, say, uh, I don't know, x squared plus 9x plus 17, and I do the, the derivative of this, I end up with 2x plus 9 plus 0, and I don't write plus 0, I just leave like that. See? Constants disappear when you do a derivative. See? And so I have to put plus c here. I am obligated to. And so I am not quite done finding p of x. See, I'm not quite done finding p in terms of x because I exactly have a c going around. Cierto? Fortunately, this problem gives us very valuable information for finding out what c is. What we said earlier was going to be very useful, that the company makes a profit of blah when they produce 15 cars, cierto? is applied now. So the company makes a profit of $260,000 when they produce 15 electric cars. See? So I'm going to plug in 15 for X, uh, $260,000 for Y, and work from there. Cierto? And so the beautiful thing that just happened, why we did it in the first place, is that before we had two variables. Cierto? We had the variable of X and C. Now we have only the variable of C and a bunch of numbers. So I move those numbers around, find out what C is. Well, play around with your calculator. You're going to find out that C is negative 280. C is negative 280. I plugged that in over here for what I had before. And that is quite literally part A. All right, and now for part B, before we move on, a uh, small detail here. I did conclude that C was uh, negative 280, but I plugged in plus. So, you know, no one's perfect. I include myself in that. Uh, anyways, so, see, negative 280 for C. Uh, for part B, we have described how their profit changes if they increase production to over 30 cars per month and up to 50 cars per month and to justify our answer that way. So from here, there's like a lot, a lot of different ways to approach this problem for concluding how their profit changes. See? So I think I'll try to give the most intuitive way to approach it. See? And that is, since we are talking about how their profit changes, ¿cierto? it's very useful to look at the rate of change. See? So rate of change, which is the derivative right here, ¿cierto? remember that whatever this spits out, spits out the rate of change. See? So the moment that this value turns negative, that means our profit is decreasing. See? It's not necessarily that our profit is negative, it means that our profit is decreasing. See? A good example of this is say you have like a parabola like that, ¿cierto? And you say, okay, all of these values here are the rate of changes that are here are negative, right? But they're still in the positive part of my graph, ¿cierto? Once they turn down here is where it's actually negative, see? So not because it has a negative slope or a negative rate of change means that the actual values are negative. Keep that in mind. However, that does allow us to approach how the profit changes, which is the main thing here, see? So for dp dx, ¿cierto? I'm going to plug in 30 first, right? And we end up with negative uh, 1.6 times 30 plus 48. See? So we need to see if this is positive or negative. Work from there. We can see the negative 1.6 times 30 plus 48 actually gives you 0. See? And so right at the 30th car, ¿Cierto? Sold. Um, profit is zero. See? So profit zero in the case of selling 30 cars. What happens if we s sell a greater number, for example, 50 cars per month? See? So again, dp dx, but for 50, we have negative 1.6 times 50 plus 48. Will it be positive or negative? Let's find out. Um, negative 1.6 times 50 plus 48. We can see that it's negative. See? And so this negative 32 is less than zero, which means that profit decreases. See? 
And so, funnily enough, even though they sell more cars, there is less profit, all right? The intuition of like real life in this scenario is that maybe they don't get to sell the cars at the same price. Maybe, you know, like they have a certain amount of buyers and they can't sell them all, stuff like that, see? Anyways, point is, it's very evident that the more cars that they sell, profit actually decreases, see? So that is a big conclusion here. More cars sold, um, profit decreases, see? So they're better off selling less cars, a limited amount of cars, stuff like that, see? So that is the main way to conclude this. Other ways that you can conclude it is plugging in into here, so you're still plugging here 30, here 50. And so you're not looking at the rate of change, you're looking at like the raw profit and just compare the profits. Does it decrease, does it not? What we compared down here was the rate of change, see? So we saw that as more cars were sold, profit is each time less and less. But what you can do up here is first see a negative trend and second actually announce um, like how much profit it's getting or not, see? Anyways. All of those ways work, all of the approaches are correct. That is number 13, and that is this paper. I hope it helped. We, you know, eso. Have a wonderful day. Take it easy.